So um, I would like to start here just uh, me giving a very brief uh, presentation of my research. And then I will look into uh, a bit of a different approach to consciousness. Okay, so my thesis is titled uh, The Part Hold Problem, Applying the Holistic Thought of Otto Rank and David Bohm to Contemporary Psychotherapy. The study assumes Rank's part hold problem as a point of exploration and inquires into the self-cosmic uh, root through David Bohm's holistic framework for understanding different aspects of reality, which he conceptualizes as the implicate and the explicate order, which together form a whole of which a self is an integral part. One can say, say that the unfolded or implicate order functions as an underlying structure of meaning from which an explicate order, which is the world of classical physics, linear time, space, object, and subject, unfolds. And that is basically the world which we perceive normally. Otto Rank, uh, if you're not familiar with him, he was contemporary with Freud and collaborated uh, closely with him for two decades until they developed fundamentally different ways of thinking about the human, the life problems, and the ways of analysis. In terms of modern psychotherapy, Rank's philosophy of the psyche in ways underpins existential psychology, relational therapy, short-term treatments, as well as the theories of creativity, not only as in art, but as you will have described very well, the art of living and creativity as a constituent of self-becoming. David Bohm, on the other hand, he was born in Pennsylvania in the beginning of the 20th century and died in the UK in 1992. He was a theoretical physicist and philosopher and has developed one of the most significant quantum theories so far. I think what's most important about him is that he, has, he relates his theories back to the human a lot. He drew on implications derived from quantum level. In quantum, as opposed to classical physics, uh, studies the relations between entities as opposed to the entities themselves. So he used this quantum <laughs> study to further explore his idea on interconnectedness. Is anyone here familiar with Bohm at all? You are? And Rank, everyone as well? Yeah? <laughs> some, some experts here on it. <laughs> I'll try see if I can add something anyways. I'll just move over to the to the, the my my main topic now. Um the living consciousness. According to Bohm, every discussion when we move into this area has starts from the idea of wholeness. So, um you know, when we approach our existence as humans, that's where where we always need to start looking. In fact, I'm going to argue that the question of consciousness, most, more so than most things, pushes us towards considering wholeness. This is because representations of mind in psychology, philosophy, and physics are, as David Chalmers noted, ultimately limited to what he called the hard problem of consciousness. While we might uh, want to understand if and how consciousness is connected to the fundamentals of reality, such as time and space, uh, if, if it, too, is a fundamental uh, feature of reality, even a universal such, as in panpsychism, for example, where consciousness, um, as Chalmers describes, it dangles not at the side of matter, he says, but is rather there at the heart of things. Why we would like to get answers to this, what we get from physics, basically, and psychobiological approaches, are strictly functional uh, instructional descriptions, which means that we have correlations basically, but not uh, explanations. So this um, very much implies uh, applies to mainstream psychology's current behavioristic, neurobiological, and cognitive focus. For example. <clears throat> We might know what area of the brain is engaged in certain conscious tasks, but with, with all the great achievements of positivistic science, we still can't produce the answer to the question what it means to be conscious uh, during this brief moment of, 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 uh, on Earth that we know as life. We cannot measure this uh, experience, we cannot replicate it, 
or objectively describe it, uh, that very subjective experience of living. And yet I think most people would agree that that is a paramount factor of what it means to be human. So um, to outrank our awareness of consciousness of living, as he called it, is, is a paramount factor of our existence. And anxiety is understood as an un unwillingness to step in um, and to sort of surrender to this present. So his, his understanding of consciousness um, in that way different, differs from representations of mind in the classical psychoanalytical paradigm of, for, of thought, which he was originally, uh, which he originally came from. And it also is quite far from the, the positivistic, often reductionistic uh, psychological tradition. To, to him, um, self is rather relational. And he argues early on in Psychology of the Soul, uh, one of his books, that our existential development, that is the more consciousness and purpose-driven evolution of humans, entails a coming together of physics and psychology. And he said this very, very early, um, which I think is a sort of the way that research and science is going now towards a, a transdisciplinary era. I don't know if you agree, but it, do you? <laughs> Maybe. I hope. Okay, so this statement, any, anyways, uh, which he made, it can be tied back to um, one of his early works, The Trauma of Birth, which he wrote in 1923, uh, I think, where he redefines the question of existence in ontological terms, as Robert Kramer notes, rather than primarily Oedipal uh, terms like Freud. And this he does by recognizing the mother as the first object relation as opposed to the father. Uh, but he f further puts forth a very important idea that birth also understood metaphorically is the first separation a person experiences in their life. And he elaborates on this by going back to that self-cosmic relation. So by this uh, separation from cosmos that birth to entails, a person exchanges, as Martin Buber puts it, their intrinsic connection to the universe for the possibilities of a relational one. And I think this thesis has far-reaching implications because it links, again, ultimately mental life with uh, material life through what Rank called the existential unconscious or the region of the psychophysical. Uh, Robert Kramer, again, has a very interesting um, paper about this, which I think is called the existential unconscious. Uh, so we see here that um, Rank's understanding of consciousness and the unconscious differs from Freud's, and we will find the key to this conception in both their understandings of, un of, in fact, the unconscious. This unconscious Rank said partly differs from Jung's and Freud's in the sense that it remains inaccessible to any intellectual grasp. So mind, first of all, to Rank, cannot be fully covered by analysis. Uh, cannot be functionally grasped uh, like as a strictly neurobiological phenomenon, uh, nor can it be explained by Cartesian mind-body-substance dualism. Rather, mind and body must be understood as parts, like two parts forming a whole, and where we find the clue um, as to what might tie these parts together, which are fundamentally different, in um, that which uh, Bohm proposes to be an underlying structure of meaning. So not much is scientifically known about the structure or meaning. The individual's being is partly a component of, of the ineffable through this existential unconscious or psychophysical region. In order to understand why it is so, we can again return to his uh, writings in The Trauma of Birth, where at the core we have this self-cosmic uh, relations with forms that wholeness and which centers in a way in the existential uh, and the subjective. Um, so Rank says, 
the temporal, uh, the individual is, he says, the temporal representative of the cosmic primal force. While willing is a voluntary and conscious creating of one's own fate. This is very interesting and significant, I think, because that we are uh, at once masters of our own fate and self-cosmic, self-other relational creatures entails a complexity which we humans always have struggled to relate to. It, it evokes uh, an anxiety in a way which according to rank culture, which, which is that which is not nature, serves to shield us from. Ernst Becker, who wrote about Rank and Kierkegaard in his book, The Denial of Death, described this conflict very well. He says, referring to Kierkegaard, man's anxiety is a function of his sheer ambiguity and of his complete powerlessness to co- overcome that ambiguity, to be straightforwardly an animal or an angel. He cannot live heedless of this fate, nor can he take sure control over that fate and triumph over it by being outside the human condition. The human spirit cannot do away with itself, that is, self-consciousness cannot disappear, neither can man sink down into the vegetable life, as in being wholly animal, nor can he flee from dread. But, according to Rank, it is precisely actually through this um, continuous comings to and goings from this dialectical reality that we become ourselves. Come. <laughs> we must not strive for equilibrium, perfection or final answers. Life is to be lived consciously by choosing to surrender to the present again, which I said before, and to over and again choose or refuse to be stopped by the fear that arises uh, with accumulated experiences, hurts and setbacks. And again, I think the key here is in wholeness, because as Rank says, as an example, he says, anxiety, which he calls the reality problem, uh, seems to be erected as a dividing line between the I and the world, and vanishes only when both have become one, as parts of a greater whole. So back to consciousness again. Rank's understanding of it extends into the ineffable, Wherefore, the question arises, is it possible to make an objective scientific statement about it and quantify it? Ranked this way aligns with philosopher David Chalmers' ideas on the hard problem of consciousness. The nature of it remains partly a mystery. There is not yet a definition of self that is conscious, and as Kramer notes, no instrument can measure neither the absence uh, or presence of consciousness, and no one can answer the question of how the first person experience of I am emerged in the world. Uh, So this also ties back again to the part whole problem, which again refers to these dualisms between unity and separation, mind, body, self, cosmos, self, other, and these are connected to the trauma of birth, or the drama of birth, as you, you call it, Kirk Schneider, which I think is quite appropriately put. Um... This is because we have a dilemma, uh, which is uh, that at birth, according to Rank, the, the sense of feeling one with all is lost, and we begin life longing for completeness or for transcendence, but also with an underlying fear of self actualization related to a loss of connection with a greater whole. This can Uh, quite apparently, I think, be understood as a holistic model of existence, where micro and macro are understood as two aspects of a greater whole. Rank addresses this greater whole uh, of which self is an integral part, sometimes as cosmos, other times as the beyond, and our relation to it in terms of unio mystico and the uh, existential unconscious, which uh, suggests person, cosmos, mind, body connection. And the underlying idea here is uh, important that the whole precedes the parts. So my research uh, resumes Rank's line of reasoning in this regard. And again, with the help of Bohm's theory, seeks to apply a more holistic and transdisciplinary approach 
to 21st century psychology and psychotherapy. And in line with Bohm's suggestion, such endeavor demands an expansion of the way in which psychological science often is falsely understood to rest upon objective knowledge alone. Uh, okay, so we can go a little bit further now to understand consciousness uh, through Bohm, through the help of his concept of participatory thought, uh, which is the opposite to fragmentary thought. Fragmentary thought is related to the relatively one-sided interpretation that forms the basis for current psychological science, the mainstream version of it anyways. If we look more from a perspective of holism and concentric well-being, for example, all concepts, categories, and theory formations generated within such a system spring from an existential core knowledge. And this means that instead of proceeding from conceptualizations, abstract categories, or a priori reasoning, it starts with the phenomenological understanding that personal experience is the base upon which abstract knowledge is built, as Rank and as, as well as I think Mar Maslow argued. Um, so, and there's another person who's quite interesting, who's called an Italian, uh, Sabadini. <laughs> You've read him as well. Right, well, and I've yeah. seen his YouTube videos. It's oh, okay. They're wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's uh, very interesting. He goes so far as to say at, at, that um, awareness and experience is the stuff that the world is made of, as opposed to matter, as in the world of physics. So the deeper uh, philosophical aspect of this he, statement, he says, is that we all, and that basically all we have is the world as seen by, the, by uh, as seen from the perspective of uh, being uh, embodied agents. Where space and time appears as real constituents of reality. And this can sometimes be, I think, interpreted as uh, solipsistic almost. Uh, as if the claim is that the locus of all things lies within the self. This we might find relates, for example, to post to postmodern approaches, where we create the world with our thoughts. But I take it rather to point to an important truth, which the phenomenological perspective illuminates, namely that I as a person never can be removed from the experience of that which I encounter. So my experience and um, experiencing of this world entails an, an intrinsic split because, um, because of the fact that all is seen through this object, my body. But the split is contained within an overarching principle of unity, in fact, described by Rank's part hole problem. I don't know if that makes sense. But so we have a sort of a duality within non-duality. Can you say, put that, say that one more time? Duality within non-duality. What, what is the... Yeah, so, so duality and non-duality are both two, two aspects of non-duality, <laughs> basically. In fact, um, I argue that to understand this as solipsistic, is a conclusion which rather is a result, again, of fragmentary thinking, which we keep sort of naturally coming back to. It stems from a dualistic way of reasoning, in which case the mind externalizes reality into contrasting positions. Rank often criticized Freud for approaching analysis as an uh, object-subject matter, whereas Rank instead emphasized the in-betweenness and the world of relation. If we instead assume that participatory thought, which forms the opposite of fragmentary thinking, describes the true nature of reality more convincingly, it follows that the external and the internal, object and subject, act upon each other, and that reality at the very vanishing point is undifferentiated. In such case, there exists no contradiction and no division per se between the external and the internal, between object and subject, self and cosmos. So holism entails that there is no ultimate separation between the dual and the non-dual. The former is embedded in the latter. 
And this is why Bohm says that boundaries are not really separations. They are there for descriptive purposes. So I think we can say that um, the participatory and experience-based aspect of consciousness is reflected in um, the therapeutic method that Rank developed, or we can call it approach, maybe rather. I like that. Yeah, I think I, I was just writing here, which Will Wadlington writes, <laughs> <laughs> encourages um, artistic expression and collaboration between the therapist and the client as well as a here and now embodiment of the experience of that relationship or any, which you mentioned, I think, uh, Schneider, is the sensibilities arising with each encounter, including anxieties, griefs, and joys. So, lastly, I'd li just like to propose also that we can draw interesting um, parallels between Rank's strong relationality, Bohm's holistic thinking, and Martin Buber's I, thou, or Ishtu relationship and the communication that that entails. I don't know if you're familiar with Buber, but um, his, his self-construct consists of two possible ways of relatedness. One is I, thou, and the other is I, it. Where I, thou implicates a wholeness similar to that of Kierkegaard's relational self. It refers to the existential and ontological reality and the transcending space over against which the authentic self is fulfilled and actualized. So Buber further explained that while I, it, is set in the context of space and time and objective detachment, I, thou, is set in neither of these and knows no object. In the world of thou, nothing is present to a person but the bare fact of being, yet this nothingness paradoxically implicates the whole world. And he says, in this moment, man meets what exists and becomes as that which is over against him, always simply a simple, single being and each, each thing simply as being. So I think we're, we're getting an inclination here uh, from these different thinkers that the present is an open, timeless, undifferentiated and unknown thing. It holds both the potential to be beautifully awe-inspiring and terribly intimidating. On the one hand, as William James remarked more than a century ago now, we can at any given moment be in union with something beyond ourselves and find our greatest peace in that union. On the other hand, uh, the embrace of the great unknown is the free fall of experience within which we are all suspended, as Bugenthal put it, and because it entails a choice, it provokes an anxiety which risks blocking the manifestation of our will. I think the understanding that we do not just sort of slip into union or fall into a dark night of the soul, but, sh but actually choose to go out to relation, whether it be to ourselves, to another, to nature or to cosmos, is one of the greatest contributions of existential thought. And again, as Rank and Bugenthal also maintained, life, self-being and self-becoming it's not something that we, we can merely describe or analyze. Rather, it is an active choice and essentially one um, to experience. So to just sum it up a little bit, we see that rank in rank, self-becoming begins not with the assumption of a pre-existing objective world preceding consciousness or with biological preconditioned drives waiting to unfold as in Freudian thinking, but as to William James, again, with the basic fact of experience. And such approach is, I think, deeply reflected in Rank's work with clients, um, which was very, very much a work in the here and now um, and in the moment. And obviously, I think such a uh, Focus extends beyond the purview of positivistic science uh, because it postulates empirically untestable factors like will and consciousness as real constituents of self-creativity and in the shaping of reality. So we see here that reality, matter, and consciousness must rather be approached um, from a perspective of wholeness than as either-or or as parallels. 
Wholeness consists of complementary parts, the implicate and the explicate order, and Bohm draws a distinction between the implicate order, which is the domain of reality characterized by flux and potentiality, uh, and the explicate order, which is a more of a Newtonian Cartesian order of stable phenomena and actuality. We can also actually um, call these a holonomic order and a fragmentary order where, according to Bohm, fragmentary order separates and oppresses human creative activity, while holonomic order liberates and empowers people. In a fragmentary order, what to rank are dialectical complementary aspects of living, such as good and bad, unity and separation and so forth, are polarized and one is suppressed. Whereas in a holonomic order, good and bad, pleasure, pain, uh, connection and self-assertion, for example, are all parts of living, of learning, and are further understood as parts of such greater whole and underlying meaning. And finally, I will say that as an integral part of the whole, relation is the nexus of which a person's existence ultimately depends, and within which self-actualization occurs, according to Rank. If we tie this to Bohm, we see that relation means a unity of the inner and the outer. Understanding this unity is a problem science and philosophy has long strived for. It is uh, a form of knowledge that currently is not entirely explained, and traditional science tells us there is only one world in which our body exists, along with our nerves and brains, etc. Uh, and our our immediate perception of that world is taken as a proof, basically. However, if we take quantum physics as an example, it suggests that ourselves, ourselves are merged with the rest of the world through forces of interaction, light rays, etc., etc. And therefore, where do we draw the line between consciousness and matter, and between self and non-self? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>